begin our exploration from Planets to the Cosmos by taking a brief graphical tour of our universe. You are here, on the Earth, third planet from a mid-sized middle-aged star orbiting at the outskirts of a normal-sized galaxy we call the Milky Way, one of many hundreds of billions of galaxies throughout the visible parts of the universe. But as a starting point, this is a little bit large. We need to move it down to much more human scales and talk a bit about how we measure distances and what units we use to quantify the sizes of things. What better place to begin our tour of the universe from planets to the cosmos than right here on the Ohio State University's iconic oval. I'm standing on the long walk. And we're going to begin our tour with looking at the scale of the sizes of things. The fundamental scale that we're going to use in this class is one meter, shown here by a nice wooden meter stick. We're going to use metric throughout this class. Even though this meter is also marked out in inches, bear in mind that although the United States, Liberia, and Myanmar are the only countries that still use English units, we're going to stick to metric throughout. One meter sets the basic scale. One meter is about the size of a person. I'm approximately, well, a little bit under two meters in, in height. If I want to go up another factor of 10, well, I would step out around into the stone circle that I'm standing inside of, which is 10 meters in diameter. The next step up, next factor of 10, is 100 meters. 100 meters is way down there where the guy in the red shirt is waving away at the next circle down the long walk. If I want to go up to the next scale, 10 times that, or 1,000 meters, well, I got to get off the ground and use a new technology, and we'll switch over to satellite imaging. This is where we were on the Ohio State University Oval, standing on the long walk, looking off to the west-southwest towards the Oxley Thompson Library. The yellow double arrow shows where we previously had measured out 100 meters. We're now going to proceed out by powers of 10, looking at what scales we pick up with each factor of 10 in distance. From 100 meters, we want to go up to 10 times 100, or 1,000 meters. At 1,000, we change our unit to the kilometer, 1,000 meters. One kilometer from where we were standing on the oval will bring us to a point on the shores of the Olentangy River, just a little bit west of the Ohio State University football stadium. The next factor of 10 brings us to 10 kilometers, and if we were to go instead of west, east, we would find ourselves at the front door of the terminal of Port Columbus Airport, which is 10 kilometers away as the crow or the airplane flies. 10 kilometers is approximately the size of a large city, in this case, Columbus, Ohio. We're going to often compare objects that are about a kilometer to 10 kilometer to the sizes of a large city. The next scale up is 100 kilometers. 100 kilometers to the west of where we were standing on the oval would bring me to downtown Troy, Ohio, which is a small town off about 100 kilometers to the west of Columbus, Ohio. On scales of 100 kilometers or a few hundred kilometers, we're now moving out of the realm of cities, crossing many counters, counties into the realm of the sizes of states in the United States. Some states are smaller than 100 kilometers, others, like California and Texas, are a lot bigger. Let's keep going. At 1,000 kilometers, I will now be crossing many states, and indeed, nearly exactly 1,000 kilometers from Columbus, Ohio, where we were standing on the oval, is Kansas City. I'll leave it as an exercise for you and Google Earth to get together to find out if that's Kansas City, Kansas, or Kansas City, Missouri. 1,000 kilometers can be increased up to a scale by a factor of 10 to 10,000 kilometers. Now we cross not between states, but between continents. If I was to follow direct airline miles from Columbus, Ohio, and fly 10,000 kilometers, almost exactly 10,000 kilometers by a great circle track, would be Tokyo, Japan. In principle, if I had a long range aircraft, I could take off out of Port Columbus International Airport and many hours later, and 10,000 kilometers, land at Tokyo, Narita. 10,000 kilometers is a scale now that's relevant for discussing planetary surfaces. We see that the Earth, 10,000 kilometers, gets me from Columbus to Japan. The circumference of the Earth at the equator is a little over 40,000 kilometers. And so when we start talking about the scales of planets like the Earth, 
we will be using multiples of 10,000 kilometers. What if we were to go out to the next level, 100,000 kilometers? Well now, we find ourselves barely 26% of the way from the Earth to the Moon. The Moon, at its average distance, is 384,000 kilometers. So hundreds of thousands of kilometers now becomes the relevant unit to use when talking about planets and their moon systems, or artificial satellites orbiting the Earth. The furthest human beings have ever been from the Earth is 400,000 kilometers. That, that record belongs to the astronauts who orbited and stood on the moon during the late 1960s and early 1970s. If I was to go out another factor of 10 to a million kilometers, I would find myself in the middle of nowhere. Space is very empty, even interplanetary space, and we consider our solar system a relatively crowded place, cosmically speaking. That a million kilometers from anything is nowhere at all. We have to go up to 150 million kilometers before we start getting to scales which are relevant to interplanetary space. At this point, the numbers are becoming so large that we're going to leave behind the meters and kilometers we've used to this point and define a brand new unit that's relevant when we're talking about interplanetary distances. We call it the astronomical unit, or the AU for short. The astronomical unit was originally defined in terms of the mean Earth-Sun distance, and indeed, one astronomical unit is the size scale of the Earth's orbit. However, the astronomical unit in modern times is defined exactly as 149,597,870.700 kilometers. This isn't actually the distance of the Earth from the Sun, because the Earth is on a slightly elliptical orbit, and its distance from the Sun varies all the time. But this is how we are going to define the astronomical unit in terms of metric units of kilometers, and use it not only for measuring distances inside of our solar system, but use it as one of the fundamental yardsticks that we need to reach out to the stars. Moving up a factor of 10 from one astronomical unit, we go from the inner solar system, the orbit of the Earth, out to encompass the inner solar system to the orbit of Jupiter. Jupiter's orbit is about 5.2 astronomical units from the Sun on average, and so a circle of diameter 10 astronomical units across would encompass the four inner terrestrial planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, the asteroid belt, and the giant gas planet, Jupiter. Another factor of 10, and we reach the outer solar system. Now the inner planets and Jupiter are contained within the small yellow square inside 10 astronomical units. Outside in this outer region, we find the orbits of the planet Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, the dwarf planet Pluto reaches its outermost extent, and we see a numerous small dots that make up the objects of the Kuiper belt. This is not showing all of these objects, and indeed, just like with the asteroid belt, I'm exaggerating the brightness so you can see them at all. From 100 astronomical units, let's jump up another factor of 10 to 1,000 astronomical units. Now we're reaching the outermost extent of the orbit of one of the most distant objects we know of in the solar system, the candidate dwarf planet Sedna. Sedna was discovered when it was relatively close, relatively speaking, to the inside of the solar system within 100 astronomical units, but the outer edge of Sedna's long elliptical orbits can get nearly 1,000 astronomical units from the Sun. This reaches the inner edge of what is often referred to as the Oort cloud, a very, very thin and tenuous cloud containing little snowballs that when they fall into the inner solar system become comets. Some of this is the leftover gases and ices from the formation of our solar system four and a half billion years ago. From here, it might be tempting to go out by powers of 10 to 10,000 and then 100,000 astronomical units. But at 10,000, you're practically nowhere. You've reached the edge of the Oort cloud and you're out in the middle of interstellar space. In order to reach the nearest stars, you have to travel more than 200,000 astronomical units to reach the nearest star, Proxima Centauri. At this point, using hundreds of thousands of light years starts becoming ridiculous, and we've only reached the first of the nearest stars. 
So we're going to redefine yet another new unit that we're going to use to measure interstellar distances. The AU is useful for measuring solar system scales and interplanetary distances. Now we're going to introduce a unit for interstellar distances, the light year. The light year is the distance traveled by a photon, light, in one calendar year, a year being the time it takes the Earth to orbit the Sun. Put into familiar metric units, one light year is 9.46 trillion kilometers, or using our astronomical unit is 63,235 astronomical units. The nearest star, Proxima Centauri, a faint dim red dwarf star 4.22 light years away from the Sun, is about 267,000 astronomical units away. It is part of a triple star system, the core of which is a binary star system, Alpha 1 and Alpha 2 Centauri, which is located 4.26 light years away. This is the nearest by star, like our Sun, to our solar system. We've already traveled tens of trillions of kilometers away from the Earth and we've only encountered the first stars. If interstellar space was empty, you haven't seen anything yet. Zooming out to 10 light years, we find the nearest stars. Some of these are stars with familiar names. Sirius, the bright dog star of the nighttime sky, is the brightest star visible in the sky from either hemisphere. Procyon, another bright star, easily visible to the naked eye. Alpha Centauri is visible to the naked eye if you were down in the Southern Hemisphere, say in Australia or South Africa. And Tau Ceti is barely visible in the Southern Hemisphere, kind of at the edge of most people's ability to see, as are Epsilon Eridani and Epsilon Indi. If you're out at the countryside rather than a city, you'd be likely to see these three stars. All of the other stars, however, are red dwarfs or white dwarfs and they would be invisible to the naked eye and would require the use of telescope or photographic techniques to be able to see them. Within 10 light years are a few dozen stars, most of them very dim red dwarfs and white dwarfs. Jumping out another factor of 10 to 100 light years, we get into the realm of the solar neighborhood. This is the group of stars that we move around through space with and are buzzing around in, op in various and sundry directions. This is the place where we will be searching for planets around other stars there and a little bit further. Reaching 100 light years across, 100 light years across takes light 100 years to cross the distance. The circle on the inside shows the inner 10 light years that we drew before. We're getting further and further from home and yet at 100 light years, an almost unimaginably large, imaginatively large distance, a distance of a thousand trillion kilometers from the Sun, we're still in the neighborhood. We're now going to take some bigger logical jumps out to 500 light years and finally out to 5,000 light years. Now the distribution of stars begins to show some gaps and bright and pileups. These dark empty spots and pileups, you can see there's a long group here, long and thin, that makes itself visible, this is the Orion arm of the Milky Way spiral galaxy. We're also beginning to get it out into the realm where we begin to see immense glowing gas clouds and dark clouds of dusty molecular material that are the nebulae, the clouds in space. Jumping out further still to 100,000 light years, we now get into the realm of the Milky Way galaxy. This is not a picture of our galaxy, we can only see it from the inside, but it is an artist's reconstruction based on the best data available to us. The Sun is located down here between two spiral arms, approximately 26,000 light years from the galactic center. We're not at the, completely at the outside of the Milky Way, but in fact are pretty far along. We're about halfway to the outer visible edge. Although Galaxies don't have a sharp outer edge, at least certainly the Milky Way does not. They tend to kind of just fade away as the stars get thinner and thinner on the ground. Now you can see the bright spiral arms, pileups of stars, gas, and dust that give our galaxy its name, a spiral. We see many billions of these spiral galaxies throughout the universe. 
From a thousand light years, we need to make a big jump out to a million light years. When we get out to a million light years, we have now lipped away from the Milky Way and are out into the regime of the Milky Way and its many satellite dwarf galaxies. We're only showing a few of the brighter dwarf galaxies. They're estimated to maybe be as many as a hundred, most of them ultra faint, and can only be found through the most exquisite of astronomical techniques. We have two bright satellite, relatively bright dwarf satellites of the Milky Way, the Large and Small Magellanic Clouds. These are among the most distant objects that are visible to the naked eye. If you ever get a chance to go down and visit the Southern Hemisphere and go to a dark place, for example, out in the dark skies of rural Australia or South America or South, um, South America or South Africa, you'll be able to see the Large and Small Magellanic Clouds high in the sky. You'll also see the bright band of the Milky Way galaxy. The Large Magellanic Cloud, which will be the brightest of the two, is over 150,000 light years away. It's not the most distant thing we can see. To see that, we have to go out one more step to 10 million light years. At 10 million light years, we now find that the Milky Way does not travel alone through space. In addition to its retinue of dwarfs that orbit around the common center of mass of the Milky Way, the Milky Way is itself part of a massive group of galaxies consisting of one other bright galaxy of comparable mass, the Andromeda Galaxy, located about a little over 2 million light years away, and the Triangulum Spiral Galaxy. The Milky Way and Andromeda are near twins of each other. The Andromeda Galaxy it's just barely visible to the naked eye in the northern hemisphere, and it's a little bit bigger than a couple times the diameter of the moon. Under really dark sky conditions, if you know where to look, you can see the Andromeda galaxy with the naked eye, making it, in terms of objects we can see all the time under the right conditions, the most distant object the human eye can see. This group of galaxies are all bound together by their mutual gravitation and move together through space as a dynamical group. If we go up another factor of 10 or more, now to 200 million light years, we find that in that step of 10, we've gone from the local group of galaxies, shown in this little yellow sphere where we were before, out into the local Virgo supercluster of galaxies. Many galaxies like to go together in groups. Large groups, bigger than 30 bright galaxies, are what are referred to as galaxy clusters. The largest really big cluster to the Milky Way and the local group is the Virgo cluster, located out here at a distance of nearly 50 million light years in these units. Within 200 million light years, we find that even the clusters and groups tend to cluster together into long chains and associations that are referred to as superclusters. The local supercluster because the brightest member is Virgo, is referred to generically as the Virgo supercluster. If we go out another factor of 10 or so to 1 billion light years, or 1 giga light year from home, the Virgo supercluster now shrinks and shows itself to be one of but a large number of superclusters that surround us in the local volume a billion light years across. Light takes a billion years to cross the space that we are looking at now. This is a map of the brighter regions within the local, vo local supercluster volume. We see that space is no longer filled with galaxies, but has immense voids with large walls and filaments surrounding them. These voids and filaments make up the so-called large-scale structure, the largest organized systems we see throughout our universe. How far can we go? The furthest we can go is to the visible horizon of the universe. This is a zone 91 billion light years across. The universe was formed in the Big Bang approximately 13.8 billion years ago. If I look out with the naked eye, I shouldn't be able to see anything because stars and galaxies didn't get going until quite a, while, quite a long time after the Big Bang. However, a little over 100, 200,000 years after the end of the Big Bang, the universe was no longer hot and opaque and suddenly became transparent. And if I look at the sky, not with human eyes, which see visible light, but with microwaves and radio telescopes, then I can see the faint leftover relic heat 
from the formation of our universe, the so-called cosmic background radiation. If I look at detail at the cosmic background radiation, I see that it's not smooth, but in fact, there are hot spots and there are cold spots shown by the different colors. Blue spots are cold, hot spots are red. Kind of a backwards color map as far as how hot and cold things really look, but we're not gonna dwell on that right now. Each of these spots is different in temperature from its surroundings by one part in 100,000. We're looking at faint fluctuations at the few tens of micro Kelvin scale on the face of the radiation coming off of the hot Big Bang. Each of these tiny fluctuations turns out to be very important because they are going to be the seeds from which galaxies and stars and planets and people will ultimately form. How do we get from the oval to the visible horizon of the universe? Well, we're going to start over again and then spend the next 14 weeks exploring our universe from planet Earth to the depths of the cosmos.